Okay, welcome everybody to our 10 a.m. press conference. This is Combating Coastal Land Loss. Our presenters today are Jai Savitsky from the University of Colorado, Robert Twilley from, Louis from the Louisiana Sea Grant, Samuel Bentley from the LSU Coastal Studies Institute, and Yap Ninius from Tulane University. So I'm gonna kick this off by showing a few slides about deltas, our uh, theme here today. And uh, the picture is to remind, I don't think I need to remind anyone in this room, but maybe somebody uh, who's streaming this, that wetlands are part of deltas and it, they're wet, as Robert would say. <laughs> and uh, so deltas are very dynamic. Uh, they, uh, there's a lot of channel switching, and, and with that, there could be uh, shoreline changes. That's all part of natural variability. But the, what we're here to reflect on is that uh, humans have got in the picture and have changed some of those dynamics, and to such an extent that it's worrying everyone. And my presentation today is just to quickly put deltas in perspective from a global perspective, and my uh, friends will tell you a little bit more on how this relates to the Mississippi. So this is a set of uh, satellite images. Each frame is one year. And if you were to, if I was to hold on to where the shoreline was in 1984, you will see that basically the land is disappearing rapidly. There's two aspects to this. One, the shoreline could be pushed ashore or the land could sink. In this case, you're looking at sinking land. And so the land is literally disappearing in front of us. If you looked at some areas here, you can see that there is a barrier island that's moving with the sinking of the delta. That's uh, very common. So this sinking deltas, this is a really big deal because all over the world, uh, deltas are sinking much faster than sea level is rising. And uh, on average, it's about four times faster than sea level is rising. But for some of these deltas, it's like 10 times or 100 times faster than sea level is rising. So the story is, in many cases, it's sinking. And without question, all the sinking is because of human activity. In uh, Jakarta, uh, this is by Del Terris, uh, Knowledge Institute in the Netherlands. We can see that over the last 35 years, it's sunk four meters in places. I mean, that's a lot, right? In uh, Chao Phraya, it's another uh, delta in Southern Asia, Southeastern Asia. It's sinking at 100, 100 millimeters per year. And remember, sea level is only rising now at three millimeters per year. So the sinking is really the main story. We also know that in, this is the Po Delta in Europe, it's sinking, it was sinking at 1958 to 62 at around 60 millimeters per year, which is still so much faster than sea level rise because during that time sea level was only rising at about one millimeter per year. This was from uh, mine, uh, mining for gas. This is mining for water. This is mining for water and um, oxidation of the peat. The yellow delta, this is the, <laughs> it's unbelievable because of fish farms. Uh, it's uh, sinking uh, one meter every four years. So you're just pumping up an enormous volume of water to feed these fish farms because of the toxicity related to their fecal matter in these fish farms, and that's just collapsing the land surface. And part of the story is why. So why? So the why is we used to have these as uh, rice bowls of the world, and now we've changed them to protein bowls, for all for very good reasons. Not because necessarily we're switching from uh, beef to shrimp, but because in most of these places, you can uh, send your kids to school simply because you are now earning much more money growing shrimp and fish than you are if you were growing rice. And you're pumping the water up. 
So this is an article that came out in Nature that basically here we have the maximum sediment available. In other words, these rivers are putting out, this is before humans got into the picture, and this is the sediment needed to keep and maintain that delta surface. And so there's a, it's hard to see here, but there's a line up the middle, and most of the large deltas um, cannot maintain themselves even, even without human uh, damming of the upstream systems. And we now have got, we built one major dam every, uh, 100, every day for the last 130 years. And so even under ideal conditions without damming, we don't have enough sediment for sea level rise. And with damming, we can't maintain these deltas. So we're in a different world. And my last slide is just to show that the Mississippi is here. This will lead off to my next speaker. And we have all of these problems. It could be people moving to the system, uh, high population. The largest uh, urbanization and migration on Earth's history has been into deltas because they're very flat surface. And uh, all the mega cities, we only had three or four mega cities 100 years ago. And now almost all of the mega cities that have happened to pop up are on deltas. Um, that's not necessarily the case for the Mississippi, but we have all of these other uh, impacts, such as gas extraction, oil extraction, oxidation of peats, and things like that, which are causing the land to sink. There's other reasons that this is involved, and I can talk to you about offline uh, on, on those aspects. But we are impacting the deltas. We're in a new world, and now we're trying to figure out what to do about it. So I'll leave it with that. Robert? No problem. <laughs> oh, and oh, add, yeah, can I see yeah, this? My on, one sure. slide, the well, last slide. So usually we talk about, when we talk about human interaction, we talk about flight or fight. We either fight and, and build a barrier or we run away. Those are the two choices we have. In China's case, they want to build a seawall, 11,000 kilometers, and they're already starting on this, greater than the Great Wall of China. And here they want to go from uh, Vietnam all the way up to North Korea and put this seawall in, and they're starting this. And, and of course, this has impacts on all the wetlands because you're going to disconnect it from the ocean. The migratory birds will be affected. And there are bad problems with pouring cement at that volume in terms of greenhouse gases. So, Robert. Hi, I'm Robert Twilley uh, with Sea Grant, Louisiana Sea Grant and, and uh, LSU. And Jai has set up a really um, important uh, story uh, about deltas, and that is this concept of maintenance and, and the fact that uh, deltas are sinking. What I want to do is drill it down to uh, a location that uh, where we are right now, where we're, where we're sitting, and that is the uh, the Mississippi River Delta. I know this is a busy slide, but just to tell you, I want to tell you the story that I'm going to unfold here up front, and then I'm going to show you uh, uh, some of the demonstrates, some of the, the data that we've been collecting and analysis to relative to these points. I'm going to talk about migration of the Gulf of Mexico landward. Uh, we're going to do that by talking about uh, the marsh the water ratio. If you, we're going to look at pixels of landscapes. Say we look at a pixel the size of this room. 50% uh, of this room was marsh and 50% of this room was water. Uh, we're going to use that as an index to actually measure the rate at which the Gulf of Mexico has been moving in. We're going to do that across two coastal basins, the Atchafalaya Basin, where the river actually is still connected to the landscape. So we can think of that as sediment rich. And we're going to compare that to the Terrebonne Basin, which has been disconnected from the river. We can think of that as sediment poor. And I'm going to compare then the migration rates using this index of marsh to water between those two basins and look at the power of the river related to maintenance that I was just talking about in deltas. And we're also going to look at that as well, what does that mean to us? And we're going to, we're going to translate that into wave power. 
because wave power uh, influences the flooding vulnerability. So we're gonna look at landscape changes and the changes in waves and flooding risk to our communities. And finally, I'm gonna show you how, in fact, by using the river management, we propose that you can actually increase the maintenance in across our landscape if we use the river properly. So we all know this image very well. This is the uh, depiction of what we can anticipate in the next 100 years along coastal Louisiana using what we call a static model, which is really the, uh, the same as filling up a bathtub with water, assuming a certain sea level rise and subsidence rate. You'll notice where New Orleans is located, where we're sitting here today over the next 100 years, but I want us to focus in this little yellow circle, which is to the west of here in a place called the Chafly Basin and Terrebonne Basin. But the key here is the question is what will be the projected land migration, a landward migration, as you, you can see in this picture, over the next uh, 100 years. And what do we know that's happened in the last 75 years that give us some insights to this potential change? And we're gonna do that, again, by setting up this idea of two coastal basins with and without sediment. And the key here is that as you see the old river control structure, that the Chafly Basin that's to the east, I'm using a map here, a 1944 map, of how the river was connected to the coast that was done by Fisk. And you can see by the yellow, the blue lines, how the river, orange lines, how the river was connected in these coastal basins in the past. The, that, that connection was maintained in 1963 when the old river control structure was built and river sediment has stayed connected to the Chafly Basin since that point in time. However, in 1904, a dam was constructed where Bayou Lafourche was disconnected from the Mississippi River and since then the sediment supply has been reduced by 70%. So what we have here over the last several decades is a landscape with and without the Mississippi River and I'm going to look at the, the, the migration of the Gulf of Mexico as a result of that in these two coastal basins. The satellite image in 2011 depicts again this comparison of to your west here and in that yellow line, the Atchafalaya Basin, as you can see the sediment plume that's provided by the old river control structure flowing Mississippi River water down into this basin, in contrast to the lack of a sediment plume in Terrebonne Basin there by the Rid Era which again, since 1904, has been disconnected from the river. So what I'm go we're gonna do, in that, and this is in just position to New Orleans. And again, I'm gonna use these two basins, look at land migration of the Gulf of Mexico to compare this idea of delta maintenance with and without sediment supply. And to give you further evidence that in fact the power of the river to build land, there are actually two small deltas being built presently, Wax Lake Delta and the Chafly Delta, where land is actually building since 1973 in, these two coastal in, the, in this coastal basin. Now, what I'm showing you here, again, across a satellite image in 2011, which may I add was one of our flood years, you'll see again, focusing on the left here, Terrebonne and, and Atchafalaya, I have two lines, a white line and a blue line. The white line is the 50% isoplast, so that, again, a pixel that has 50% marsh and 50% water. That is the location of the 50% ratio across the entire coast of Louisiana in 1932. And then I'm showing you the same isoplath in 2010 where the water was 50% and the marsh was 50%. And as you can see, the separation between these two lines represents the migration of the Gulf of Mexico landward. You'll notice in the Atchafalaya up to the east, I mean to the west, and again, this is the Atchafalaya Basin microphone. Yes. This is the Atchafalaya Basin right here. You can see, as I show in these two arrows, there is no significant migration of this shoreline since from 1932 to 2010. But in the basin where the sediment supply has been cut off, you actually see the shoreline is migrating. And in fact, we can measure that migration now at presently 200 meters per year. And this is happening in a region where we've disconnected the sediment supply. The other thing is that 200 meters per year migration rate has been increasing. It has been accelerating as the fetch uh, increases across these basins. And in fact, here are the changes in rates. Again, as this migration occurs in the sediment poor, whereas no migration has occurred in sediment rich, 
So basically when you go back to this bathtub approach, uh, looking at the, the potential changes in the coast, you'll notice that this model does portray pretty accurately what will happen in regions where there's no sediment supply. But in a region that you see here in the Chaflaya, where there is sediment supply, the migration rate may not be as significant because of the power of the river and the additions of sediments as maintenance to a delta that's sinking uh, under also the stress of sea level rise. Now, what does this mean? If this will approach the next slide, I'll tell you. <laughs> what this means, again, is this concept of fetch. Here's a 1932 isopleth of 50% marsh the water. Here's a location of migration uh, landward in 2010. That sets up more water, which we calculated could be a 50 to 100% increase in wave power in the regions in Terrebonne Basin where, in fact, the, the landward migration has occurred. And that is not just wave power, but also surge will increase accordingly as well in the regions where the migration has occurred. Now we think, actually, there are ways then, of, the question is, well, how can you harness this capacity of the river to modify these projections of this landward migration in the presence of sediment supply? And we would argue that, in fact, this region can be an analog to tell us what we can do over here to the east of building an envelope, maybe not so much increasing the landward or the seaward migration, but again, delta maintenance, maintaining a landscape change with the, with the uh, changes that were occurring in river management. So can you apply this design of the Chaffly here to the east around New Orleans to build an apron around the city? And we would argue that, yes, you can with, by using controlled floods with estuarine recovery related to the uh, fact that the power of the river during flood events, if you release those, instead of going strictly from flood control to control floods, that and during high pulsing events that we saw in 2011, that you have a maintenance capacity of the river in this region. Now the concern is fisheries, that in fact that this will, uh, that, that such events would be at the expense of fisheries in our regions. But in fact, if you go back to the Chaffalaya, you'll actually find oyster fisheries and shrimp fisheries and other fisheries that are at the mouth of that river. And we argue that in fact the secret there is this pulsing and maintaining it on an annual average, a 60-day annual pulse duration that will then actually allow for what we call estuarine recovery. So we don't talk enough about estuarine recovery related to operations of river management that can actually uh, provide maintenance along our coastline. And so at 800,000 cubic feet per second, we found that, again, over the last 60 years, it would give you an annual average duration of a pulse of 60 days, which we will maintain would actually promote estuarine recovery in fisheries. So I want to thank you for that, and we'll actually drill down because what I want to see, in, you'll see in the next talk, you'll see this migration here, and Sam, I was going to set you up with this. Uh, you see this migration at the mouth of the river, and you may ask, well, why are we getting a migration here and not here? And that's, Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sam Bentley. I'm a director of the LSU Coastal Studies Institute. Uh, thank you, Jai and Robert, for uh, setting things up, and thank you very much, all of you, for being here. So I'm going to uh, focus now on the lower Mississippi River. This is New Orleans. These are the mouths of the Mississippi. And uh, we're going to sort of drill down, as Robert was saying, uh, to look in a little bit more detail at the, ma at the major navigation corridor for waterborne commerce leaving North America. So the lower Mississippi River and the delta associated with it drive major natural and socioeconomic systems uh, for the entire North American continent. Just an example, 60% of our corn exports leave through the lower Mississippi River. So this is an international trade. It impacts uh, countries around the world. Uh, the approximate value of navigation going out of Southwest Pass, which is the primary nav navigation corridor for the Mississippi, is $275 million per day. 
So, so this is clearly of national and international significance in terms of both natural ecosystems, which I'm not even touching on, uh, and the socioeconomic aspects of it. Recognizing this, the state of Louisiana is investing as we speak in a, a $50 billion, 50 million year plan to manage and maintain the delta as best we can under very challenging circumstances as Jai and Robert have just mentioned. The science point that I want to make to you today is that relative sea level rise and the anthropogenic, the human driven change in sediment supply of the river are driving major geomorphic uh, reorganization of the lower Mississippi Delta. This is important because this is the primary navigation corridor uh, leaving uh, the central part of the continent and the Delta provides a very valuable uh, force in terms of uh, reducing storm surge and maintaining uh, the reducing risk on our coastline. So just for uh, reference, New Orleans is here. This area is called Head of Passes. This is the historic diversion or uh, separating of the three major historic distributaries of the Mississippi Delta. So this is called Head of Passes. This is Southwest Pass, the major navigation outlet, and the other two historic outlets, Southwest pa or South Pass and Pasalutra. Two points I want you to, want to get out of this. Uh, first of all, uh, that uh, there are, are actually three outlets of the river that are major historic outlets. Second of all, you can see just by looking at the water, the, the sediment laden water upstream from this major location is that much of the water doesn't leave the historic outlets but actually exits the river upstream. This is something that not a lot of people recognize but it's an important factor in the Mississippi system. And this is one of the reasons why. In this slide, I'm showing you the uh, discharge of the river, shown here in this plot in green, from uh, above Head of Passes, so adding up all the water that's leaving upstream of Head of Passes, and the, the brown line indicates the amount of water that's leaving the river downstream of Head of Passes. You'll notice that these two are converging. The, down, the, uh, the upstream discharge is increasing, the downstream discharge is decreasing. So the water balance is changing in the lower delta. This is a fundamentally changing how it operates. It's also, this is also altering the sediment, uh, the sediment balance in the river. This figure shows the historic sedimentation patterns in the channel of the Mississippi River, approximately between New Orleans and Head of Passes. And what you'll note that in, night, in the 1960s and 70s, this channel was eroding, was, was erosive. It was able to maintain itself with its own stream power. Then in the 1980s and into the 2000s, this changed. It's a long-term trend, but we've shifted from being erosional to depositional. So the river is no longer maintaining its own channel as it did 40, 50, 60 years ago. So it's a fundamental change in the way the river is actually operating. So water is all changing, moving upstream, sediment is changing, moving upstream. And now we're going to look at uh, uh, some recent work that uh, one of our collaborators has done looking at the historic changes in the actual outlets of the river. So the, uh, there have been many versions of this figure that have been published in the scientific literature. And what it shows is the natural extension, the natural progradation of the Southwest Pass outlet of the Mississippi River that we've been mapping since the 1700s. So this is long before major levees were built. And what we can see is that from the 1700s into the mid 20th century, this, nat this channel was extending itself into the Gulf of Mexico to some extent you know, altered by engineering, but for the most part, this is a natural process that it was happening well before humans really altered the system. So what's happened now? The rate of progradation has decelerated. And in fact, if you look at the other two historic outlets, Pasalutra and um, South Pass, they are actually now in full-blown retreat. The location of the river channel is migrating in a landward direction. So this is a function of both uh, the landscape uh, uh, sinking and also the reduction in sediment supply from the river, as, all, as well as the change in the river power that we see in the relocation of the water and the sediment balance. So just to wrap things up, this is a, uh, a major uh, national and international uh, valuable system. The state has got a major plan for restoring it. Funding this program is a challenge, and I think, in my opinion, this should be a national priority for us because of the value of this system. And 
So to wrap up, the equilibrium delta location for the Mississippi River is migrating upstream. As we've seen, so it doesn't mean that the delta is going away entirely, but the natural, the place where it wants to build land is changing. So restoration strategies ought to acknowledge this as a, uh, uh, as a mechanism that we can take advantage of rather than try to push against. And strategies should focus on building land, working with the river at upstream locations. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Yap, who's going to back out again uh, to take a more global perspective. Yes, I'm going to take it a step back um, and, and say something about analysis work that I've been doing and, and just presented on here and trying to estimate what deltas look like and how they're going to change on a, on a global scale. Um, what we've presented here um, is a new method to estimate how much tides and waves, so the, the main marine factors that shape these river deltas, um, to estimate how much sediment they actually move and to come up with a, a predictor that allows us to estimate how much they will change uh, due to humans. And we've, um, this method we've applied to about 14,000 deltas globally. So not just the Mississippi or a bunch of well-known examples, but, but basically all the deltas in the world. Uh, and one of the, the findings of this work is that humans will all, or uh, already have changed thousands of deltas globally. So people generally have, have classified deltas as being uh, wave-dominated or, or tide-dominated or river-dominated by, by looking at the shape. So with a very smooth coastline, uh, people have said that they're wave-dominated. With a lot of these tidal channels, people classify them as tide-dominated. Um, and this is um, a snapshot of the Mississippi, which people have called river-dominated. And, and what our new method has been able to do is, is predict what the shape of these deltas is based on how much sediment delivers, uh, is delivered by the river uh, to the coastal zone. So this is a map of all of these shapes globally. And you see here the Mississippi is being classified as, as river dominated. Um, what we also have is a database of, of how humans have changed how much sediment is delivered to the global ocean. Um, so this is a, a paper put, put forward by, by Cohen et al. In, in 2013. And what you see here is that all the blue dots are where sed sediment supply to the ocean has changed, uh, has decreased basically to zero, uh, primarily due to things like river damming. Um, in Southeast Asia, you see a big increases in the amount of fluvial sediment transported uh, to the two deltas. Um, which in those cases is primarily due to things like land clearing, so deforestation that has increased fluvial sediment supply. What this allows us to do is to look at and estimate what the delta shapes were, so whether they were wave dominated or tide dominated or river dominated in a world without humans, and then look at, at how all of these deltas has changed uh, due to humans. And this is an example uh, of such a change. So this is uh, one of the mouth of the, the Nile Delta coast, uh, which as you can see here is, is wave dominated, but just because of the construction of, of the Aswan Dam in the 60s, the amount of fluvial uh, transport, the amount of sediment transported uh, to the coastal environment has decreased rapidly. So notice, notice the scale here, this is one mile, and this is a snapshot of about 20 years, so you see many hundreds of meters uh, per year of erosion just because of the construction of this dam. And this is another mouth of the Nile that shows a pretty similar picture. I just wanted to point you at the scale and the, the magnitude of these changes, which is many miles in, in, just, in just a few decades. So our analysis has shown, for instance, for these deltas, how wave-dominated deltas, so these, these types of deltas, even though um, they, they remain wave dominated, they change their shape and they flatten out. Um, so they, they become a lot less pointy just because um, fluvial sediment supply to these deltas uh, has decreased due to humans. So um, because of, of the way humans have, have changed the amount of, of 
of sediment transported to the ocean, we can say that thousands of deltas will experience severe coastal erosions, um, especially in Southeast Asia. A lot of deltas will also grow significantly. Um, and, that, and that 60 uh, river-dominated deltas with, with abundance of, of marshland and other uh, types of ecosystems will become wave-dominated just because of big decreases in, in fluvial sediment supply. And just to note that all of these analyses are just in, in how much humans have changed sediment delivery to the ocean, and it does not include things like sea level rise or other factors that, that of course, will change deltas as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now take questions from um, any reporters in the audience. Um, if you could please state your name and affiliation um, before asking a question. Do you have a microphone? Is the microphone on? Yes. Any, re any reporters have any questions in the room? Just raise your hand. Hi, my name is Mary Miller and I'm from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. And we have a, I guess we're a wave dominated but it's very unusual because most of our sediment is up from San Francisco Bay and then um, comes through. And I'm just wondering what, um, you know, we're faced with some of the same problems, maybe not as severe. Um, what, what sort of ramifications or, or, or remedies can we recommend in our communities for, for helping to battle this problem of sea level rise and land subsidence. You, are you talking about the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta? Yes. Okay. I can try to say a comment or two. So you have uh, a, a delta system that uh, is probably worse off than the Mississippi. You just don't know it. <laughs> um, that, that's the sad news. Uh, you know, the, uh, a lot of the crops, I mean, the good, the good news is that uh, flat, rich, organic delta system is one of the largest uh, food producers in the country, if not the world. And, but a lot of the farming has uh, switched to very uh, water intense crops, including almonds as an example. And, uh, you know, this is a climate system that every, it, it's, Every decade, the variability changes back and forth between wet and dry, and you've gone through a very dry one lately. And you've been pumping up water at an enormous rate. And so the delta has been sinking at a rate that is only allowing the farming to exist and not be below sea level, simply because of all the engineering structures that are put around the system. So that's your state of affairs uh, by pumping this water from below, you basically are drying out and oxidizing a lot of the organic matter uh, that's in that system. Um, the, the, un, the unhappy story on this is that you really can't pump the water back in and uh, pump up the land. So you are now in a situation of maintenance of an area that's not unlike the uh, you know, the uh, rhine Meuse Delta of the Netherlands where it's maintenance and it's the cost of maintenance. Um, you have all these dams, I suppose some of that could put some of the sediment back onto the landscape if uh, the dams were built in such a way that they could flush the sediment that's being trapped in the dams to those lowland areas. But many of these dams went in much many, many, many decades ago. And because of that, uh, they were built to modern standards that allow sediment flushing. So it's basically sediment trapping. So um, you're in a world, you're in an engineered world now. Uh, and I just uh, have an additional question about that because our governor has uh, proposed a big project to actually build a tunnel to divert water from higher up in the delta underneath what is the current system so that it can supply water um, 
to uh, to Southern California from Northern California to yet another big engineering plan on top of what is already a so we know that when countries like uh, I'm thinking about uh, Thailand they noticed you know I showed a slide in the Chow Freya that's Thailand uh, you know they were sinking the land surface at about 100 millimeters per year uh, that's uh, a meter every 10 years it's three feet every 10 years and and they couldn't maintain that so they've introduced laws and taxes that basically suggested that a person would have to pay approximately and if you do the translation to American dollars of about one dollar per shower so you're you're paying for the use in a way that you've not seen before well that has certainly stopped the withdrawal of uh, of water from the land so there are these sort of top-down ways you can do it and and in Shanghai the Shanghai the Yangtze Delta they've introduced uh, again top-down uh, rules and regulations that would make it very expensive to pump up as much water from the ground in the Po Delta that I showed where you're pumping up too much methane and collapsing the land they just stopped it and it went back to ambient conditions so you don't get the you, you can maintain it, what it where you're at, but you, it won't get worse. Right now, many of these places are getting worse. And so uh, I think that, <laughs> I think California has to figure out basically not to make matters worse because uh, the, the lower the land surface is, the greater the expense will be to maintain these systems. And I was going to AGU uh, not too long ago, I think maybe a decade ago, I forget when the flood was, and a lot of the levees on the Sacramento Delta uh, broke, and you had this massive, and I was taking pictures, I was thinking, this is so cool. But in fact, you know, it's livelihoods and real world situations, and it becomes more and more expensive to maintain that. So that's the situation you're in. I'm Mark Schlefstein with uh, NOLA.com, The Times Picayune. Uh, Dr. Bentley, uh, you talked about the uh, the bottom of the river needing to be basically abandoned, is what I hear you saying, uh, in uh, in favor of finding locations upriver to build new delta. Uh, but there's a political problem there, which is that you have a parish that's very uh, very aggressive in wanting to uh, restore exactly that area that you're that you've been talking about. How how do we deal with this, and how much more time do we really have to get things underway? Well, uh, we don't have much time at all. Uh, the rate at which uh, the landscape is sinking and the coast is moving northward is uh, is quite impressive. The where's that coming from? Feedback. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, the you're ag ac ac absolutely right. Scientists and engineers can uh, can offer uh, guidance, but fundamentally, it's a socio-political decision that the state has to make, and that's where the newest component of our state's master plan comes in: is a very aggressive outreach and human evaluation of the problems. And uh, uh, I wouldn't dream of. Uh, suggesting what uh, the people of uh, St. Bernard or Plaquemines Parish can or can't do, but there are some scientific realities to how the system is operating right now that, uh, that have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the state is wrestling with that uh, as best they can right now. And uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm involved with the planning process of the master plan, and it's a uh, it's a much stronger, much stronger plan and uh, design than it was uh, uh, five years ago or ten years ago, and hopefully uh, we can find some uh, resolution with uh, with the needs of these parishes and the realities of uh, coastal change. Do we have, do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Do we have any questions from reporters on the chat? Okay, well that will conclude our press conference. Our